Hi, Ben Pierce from the Rosa Tracker, and today I want to talk a little bit about something exciting that happened today, and that is the launch of Blue Origin's new Shepard Space Shack. Now, they've launched this many times before. In fact, this is their 11th time. There was nothing particularly special about this, but they're getting closer and closer to a milestone that I've been looking forward to seeing for a long time, and that is the ability to send humans into space on commercial transport vehicles. This has never happened before, with the exception of the three flights of the Spaceship One, and arguably, depending on what you define space as, Spaceship Two has also kind of done that a little bit. But aside from that, we haven't sent humans into space in any kind of form at all. And hopefully, someday, somebody will be able to do that that has a decent amount of money, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so how is it that they're actually going to be able to license these things? Well, it all started back in 2004 with the Spaceship One. The Spaceship One was competing for the Ansari X Prize, which was a competition to use, have a reusable vehicle that launched into space, went at least 100 kilometers, came back down, and did that again within, I think, a week's period of time. And there were a number of teams that were competing for this prize. The one that ended up winning was the spacecraft, Spaceship One, which is currently hanging up on the top of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. It's a fairly small vehicle, actually. Now, when they started to do this, to realize that they were going to actually fly into space, there was kind of a little bit of a question here. How do we actually license these spacecraft to send humans into space. It had never been done before, and it was a difficult regulatory issue. Well, Congress passed a law that allowed them to authorize the transport of humans into space, and it allowed the FAA to set up a framework for how future missions into space would operate. And they, the same branch that launched that manages commercial space flights, the Commercial Space Transportation Division of the FAA specifically was tasked with coming up with a report that could be used to figure out the milestone of regulation to send humans into space. And in 2008, they released their report. And it's still kind of what is being used to this day for sending humans into space. Now, first of all, this doesn't count government organizations. We had NASA, who's previously sent a large number of astronauts into space. We also have had the United States Air Force that sent one person into the international definition of space and a number of them to the U.S. definition of space, which is slightly lower for reasons that I won't explain now. But how is it that we're going to license these commercial spacecraft? Well, essentially they came up with a three-phase approach. And I liken these into a mountain climbing approach. You have the Everest climbing really high adventure where you know when you're climbing Everest, you gotta really, really train for it, you gotta be in great shape, and even with all of that, you still have a decent chance of death. Although, to be fair, the commercial space flight will probably have less of a chance of dying than you would climbing on Mount Everest. Then you have the adventure, and I like this to climbing Denali, which is the highest peak in North America. You can have a small chance of dying, about one in a thousand people who, climbs, who attempts to climb the mountain dies. But overall, you're going to be much safe. You don't have to put in as much physical fitness. And it's something that a reasonably well in shape person could probably accomplish. And then you have essentially any cradle system that's going through where anybody can go walk on it and you don't even really think of a chance of death because the chance is so low you just kind of do it and you can use it for a wide number of versions and that is the commercial level of operation so in the experimental version every spacecraft is licensed independently and each one is its own little adventure it's the same way essentially that an individual launch is licensed to carry cargo into space. They're doing the same thing to carry humans. Now, how was this handled historically? Well, 
the Apollo program was the first program that I found in the United States that actually focused on the loss of crew statistics. The Apollo program demanded that there be no more than a 1 in 100 chance that the crew would die in a mission to the moon. And, by the way, they had no more than a 1 in 10 chance of having a failure that resulted in the astronaut surviving but not landing on the moon. There were nine missions that went to the moon and eight of those succeeded. So they were pretty close to actually to par for what they set out to do. Kind of amazing there. Okay, so the Apollo program had a 1 in 100 chance. The space shuttle was supposed to have a 1 in 10,000 chance based off of the engineering estimates, although we do know there was one launch failure. There's also one re-entry fail here of the space shuttle, which led to the loss of the crew in both instances, sadly. NASA, being the risk-adverse body it was, wanted to do better with the next generation. And the way that the next generation has been set forward is we're going to do commercial companies and help pay for them, but they're going to design things under our guidelines. And what guideline did they set for the loss of crew? Well, they set a number that is 1 in 270 chance of loss of crew. They have to do something, though, that a typical spacecraft that is going into suborbital will never have to deal with, and even a short-term orbital stay won't have to deal with much, and that is space debris. There's a significant risk of space debris, so they had to shield against that. But that's not something for suborbital that we'll care about. But this 1 in 270 chance is kind of the NASA's baseline set of a chance for loss of crew for going to and from the space station. Well, where do we go from there? If we're going to do any better than the experimental launches, we have to collect a lot of data. And the FAA proposed that we have at least 25 launches from a single launch provider or 50 launches in the industry as a whole, and from there collect some safety statistics. And once they do that and they have a sense of how safe the different spacecraft are, then they can set up a next level of license, the adventure level. The adventure level, I would expect, will have a loss of death, loss of crew at about 1,000. So, still pretty high, but not super terribly high. Right now, of course, there's nobody because we haven't had any really significant commercial human-capable spacecraft launched. But it is the goal, and it's being worked out there. And for long-term commercial operations, such as SpaceX's plan to send Starship from point to point on Earth, you need to have something much, much higher. No more than maybe a 1 in 10,000 or even 1 in 100,000 chance. And that will be at the commercial level of safety. And they decided rather than provide all of the safety data, they're going to take an example of the National Highway and Traffic Safety Administration, and they're going to provide a star rating. So each one of the spacecraft that does suborbital and orbital flights will have a star rating so you can get a sense of how safe they are because, quite frankly, who wants to go into an unsafe spacecraft? Not me. Okay, so we have the general system that FAA is going for. How is it that they're actually doing this right now? Well, we only have one example of a spacecraft that has any kind of a human rating that is licensed commercially in the United States. The FAA has issued a license to Spaceship 2 to launch a humans and a potential passengers into a suborbital trajectory. Of course, they can only get a little over 80 kilometers, so there's questions whether or not that's space, but we'll set that aside for now. Now, reading their license, they had one phrase that really struck me as interesting. It says, before they carry any commercial passengers, they have to verify the combined system is working as intended. And Spaceship 2 doesn't have any kind of a safety system per se. However, it can glide. And so a spacecraft, as long as it can separate, it can probably reasonably well recover. The way that the FAA is 
giving bonuses to the spacecraft is you have some inherent reliability of a spacecraft. We know historically that about 98% of launches are successful. So that's your inherent reliability. Then on top of that, you have some safety factor that is multiplied to your, your probability of, of death. So we have, if you can detect, say, 90% of the instances where your spacecraft is about to blow up, and 95% of the time you can get out of the way, well, you do some math and you find that effectively one in 18 of those instances where your escape system goes off is likely to lead to any kind of a death. And so therefore, you're much less likely to die because of the escape system. So, you know, you might have a one in 50 chance that the rocket blows up, but you only have a one in uh, maybe a thousand chance that you would actually die for this hypothetical scenario. So they might have a personal safety factor of Spaceship 2 of something on the order of 2 to 3 because it can glide and do some other things. The rocket fuel that is used in Spaceship 2 is actually not that dangerous. It doesn't explode. You, because it doesn't have liquids, you have to combine them together. Or it doesn't have the pockets that you have in solid fuel, it's a little bit more reliable, and so that probably helps somewhat to their safety rating. Blue Origin, it's very much following a traditional path. They have a big giant solid rocket motor that will allow them to escape in the event of an emergency that they're testing really, really thoroughly. In my mind, Blue Origin will have the highest safety rating of any of the spacecraft in the short-term future. And then there's Starship. Starship has liquid fuel, but it doesn't have an abort system at all. Where do you put it? How do you do that? It's just two spacecraft that are connected together. And in my mind, this is one of the most difficult tasks that SpaceX is going to have to deal with. How do you human rate Starship? Well, they might be able to get to the NASA level just by launching a bunch. Really, all they can do is launch a whole bunch. The SpaceX system for Starship to inherent reliability is having multiple engines so that if any three of the upper stage blow out, it could still manage to land safely and be safe. But engine failures aren't really what has caused SpaceX any issues. They did in the early days the CRS-1 mission it also carried the Orgom uh, demo flight into space. It had an engine failure that allowed it still to carry CRS-1 to the space station, but the one engine that failed kept it from delivering the secondary payload, the Orgom demonstration satellite for OG-2, into the final orbit, and that spacecraft ended up re-entering after a short period of time. I think four days, two days. But Anyways, what do we do to get Starship human rated? And really, all they can do that I see right now is launch, launch, launch. If they can demonstrate hundreds of launches of Starship without any issues, then they're golden. They have their safety factor. Now, how about some of the missions that are proposed? Well, Dear Moon will probably operate on an experimental license. It'll be the first time carrying humans on a commercial flight, presumably outside of low Earth orbit, and so that's probably how it's going to operate. So, it poses some significant risks, but anyone who signs up there is going to know what they're dealing with. I really look forward to seeing this, and I know this is a little bit more esoteric than some of the topics I, I tend to, to talk, but regulation is really important, and regulation does, done right will really improve the way that we operate in general. Let me know in the comments which one of these three rockets you guys would fly. And my personal bet is for right now, I'd take the Blue Origin if they offered it to me for free. But I'm a little bit more leery about Spaceship 2 and about Starship for the time being. Although once they've demonstrated a higher safety record, then uh, maybe I'd be more willing to. Thank you guys so much for joining me. And until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.